Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 24th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on each week's Tuesdays show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, we start with the discussion of the legislative leadership's decision to reject the governor's call for a special session to be held in Wasilla, an issue that arose yesterday before turning to the week's top three. Once we exhaust that topic, we turn to these three. First, vetoes are coming, but they will still leave a deficit. We, dis- we discuss who will pay the taxes necessary to cover those. Second, we discuss the fake news Alaska public media spread last week about the PFD. And third, we explain why the university is failing to respond to fiscal reality. And now, let's join Michael. We've got our weekly top three I don't know if you feel like, uh, you know, you want to interrupt anything on that, but I'll, I'll let you lead the way this morning on this. Well, we, we do need to get to the top three because they're important, but let's do start with with this, with this with the events of yesterday. Um, the legislature's gone lawless. I mean, it's just, you, you can't put it any other way. They've ignored the PFD statute. They've ignored uh, the, 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 the per diem statute, and now they're ignoring a statute that's been on the books since statehood and and it's not like this statute's unambiguous i mean it's it's 20 as 2405 100b says a special session may be held at any location in the state if a special session called under a1 of this section which is the section that applies to a special session call, called by the governor if a special session called under a1 of this section is to be convened at a location other than at the Capitol, the governor shall designate the location in the proclamation. I, it's it, it's not, I mean, there's, it's not even, not even Bryce tries to argue that there's a conflict or there's an ambiguity in the statute. He, he, he just says it's a gray area because the legislature has this inherent power to do whatever the hell they come up with. And that's lawlessness. We have statutes. The reason we have statutes is to govern behavior. Is to is to keep people within a within a certain ditches. Previous legislatures have voted on these statutes. They've set these statutes in the books, and this la- this sta- this legislature has just gone completely lawless. I mean, I, we're we're off we're off in never never land uh, right. with with this body. Well, and we talked a little bit about this. I mean, what happens when you get a legislature that just blatantly continually ignores law after law after law? I mean, you're on the verge of an Irish democracy of people because at some point people will say, well, if you ignore the law, then I'll ignore the law. And then you've got the kind of beginnings of anarchy and just, you know, chaos at that point. I mean, granted, the legislature would drop the 10 ton hammer on any private Alaska citizen who broke the law while they can do so with impunity because they're the special class. I mean, it is almost the divine right of kings all over. It is the nobility. We feel it's all right to do this, which, again, just shows how out of touch they are with Alaskans. And and it's not, I mean, Michael, this is getting a little disturbing. On the Senate side, you know, the Senate said leadership decided to do this. Well, they actually didn't because the majority leader of the Senate, Mia Costello, who, who I had, had lost a lot of respect for, but it's coming back this session. Uh, uh, the majority leader is is off on the other side saying, no, the governor called it Wasilla. We ought to be having this session in Wasilla. So it's part of the leadership. And actually, when you break it down, it's eight of 14 in the uh, in the in the Senate that, that's making these decisions. I mean, the sp- there's an eight six split in the Senate uh, over this and and frankly, a lot of other things. 
And basically, it's the top 20% caucus <laughs> against the remaining 80% caucus. Right. And, right. and it's just – and it's, it, it, the, the lawlessness here is what is – is beginning to, uh, to to permeate all this and beginning to really bother me. It's like it's like yeah, we we enacted all these statutes, but but you know when we get up against a tough one and we don't have the votes to change it, we're just going to ignore it and 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 go a different direction, and, right. and 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 that's lawlessness. I mean, there's there's no other way to 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 describe what's going on than absolute lawlessness in the Alaska legislature. One final question before we jump into the top 3. Does this fracture the I mean I think the Senate majority is fractured at this point. I think it's going to come apart because I don't think that the remaining uh 7 or 8 uh, leg- uh senators who have been, you know, standing with the governor trying to get the full PFD doing all this I, I just don't have a feeling. I mean, I, I can't see Mike Shower just going along to get along on this. I, I think that this thing, at some point, I think the Senate has fractured their own majority at this point. Oh, I, uh, the Senate the Senate's clearly fractured on, on a number of issues. I don't quite know what really happens in this situation. I'll be interested when you have a chance to, to catch up with Mike or with Mia or with, or with Shelley or with others. I mean, you don't want to... You don't want to let a part of the legislature convene in in Juno, a, a part that has a quorum convene in Juno and start passing laws willy nilly. Um, so you so you really got to be a little bit careful about this situation. But but it is clear that the that the Alaska parts of the Alaska legislature. Let's be clear about that. Parts of the Alaska legislature have gone lawless, yeah. and that's just. And, and that's just hugely disturbing. I am so agitated at just the f- flippant and blatant way they admit in the release that they don't they cannot legally do this they do not have the votes to make it happen and yet again that idea that it is our right to do so is to me one of the most offensive things i have ever heard come out of a politician's mouth i mean right or left donkey or elephant that to me is the most of, it is our right to do so we have thrown revolutions over less quite honestly yeah this whole legislative right i mean uh, going back to the, the going back to the per diem the legislative right to sort of ignore that statute going back to the pfd the legislative right to ignore that statute and now the and now the legis- the asserted legislative right to ignore a statute that goes back to statehood that's the thing that really that's the thing that really gets me here we are now challenging statutes that have been on the the books since statehood um the 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 right to ignore to ignore that statute and you've got who are, who's doing it i mean this is if you if you if 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 either of us told the other you know 10 years ago that this was is who would be involved in this in this coup attempt this legislative coup attempt this legislative lawlessness attempt if either of us said john coghill kathy geisel would be among the ringleaders john coghill Kathy Giesel would be among the ringleaders of becoming of, of, of this lawlessness. Uh, it would be, you know, neither one of us would have believed it. We both would have said, no, that's not right. That can't be right. I mean, Cog, Coghill, John Coghill, Mr. Conservative would, 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 would be among the ringleaders of lawlessness. I, right. But it's, but that's exactly what we've got. That's exactly what we've come to. We've come to a situation in which John Coghill, Mr. Cons- Mr. Claimed conservative, Mr. You know, follow the const- follow the Constitution, follow the statutes, keep within the law, constitutional rights. John Coghill is a ringleader in in the in the lawlessness of the of the Alaska legislature. Yeah, we're we're, ta- we're talking we're talking about a statute his father would have followed. His father may have voted for. Um, and yet, John's a ringleader in uh, in the lawlessness of the Alaska of the Alaska legislature. I I just I'm I'm stunned at uh, at how far uh, this legislature has gone uh, off the deep end. Care to prognosticate here on what you? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you. Somebody made a mention in the chat room here a few minutes ago that said this this announcement of what the. Uh, uh, of what the legislature has done has gone out like rolling thunder. People who don't even talk about politics are talking about this new revelation. Uh, care to care to guess at the at the reaction from people as they continue to to see this kind of behavior from our legislative leaders? Yeah, I so Shelley Hughes made a comment yesterday about see you in court. 
Um, <coughs> and and I, I that intrigues me. Um, I mean, you would have to ask a court to ask to act awfully uh, awfully quickly, but but that intrigues me. I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you one thing. I think it does do though. I think it reinforces the support for the governor's vetoes that are coming up. For the legislature to act lawlessly like this, and I, and I keep using that word because that's the word that, 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 that applies in this situation, right. lawless. Right. Uh, for, the, for the legislature to act lawlessly like this, I think helps buttress support for the governor's actions to, to, try, to, to try to put the legislature back within the ditches, put Alaska government back inside the ditches. And one of and and as I say, by the end of the week, the big story is going to be the governor's vetoes. Um, and I think, frankly, it increases the support. Maybe maybe it just increases the support among his base from eight to nine. Uh, but I think at the margins, even it will increase the support for the governor's uh, uh, approach, uh, saying, "Look, we need to we need to get Alaska government back within the ditch with back within the the, the ditches. It has grown way too big for its britches. Now we've got a legislature that thinks they can go lawless on us. Um, uh, I think it will increase the support for that. Well, so." And I think that it is endangered. I mean, you look to see who's up for re-election this coming year. And I'm going to be telling you right now, I'm going to be beating the drum on the lawlessness issue for John Coghill and any opponent that he may have, Kathy Geisel, any opponent that she may have. I mean, I'm going to beat the drum so hard, they're going to be sick of me. I mean, they will they will be avoiding me at every turn because this is what people need to know. They blatantly ignored the law because it did not suit them. And, you know, in any other place, that would be that it's law breaking. That's how we do it. Uh, just because their legislature doesn't give them the excuse. You got about 15 seconds. That's going to have to happen in the primary, Michael, or else we're going to get into the same situation that we got into with Giesel last yeah. time where it was Giesel versus Beltrami. Yeah. And people said as bad as as bad as Kathy is, Vince yep. is worse. So I. <laughs> I am working hard uh, to try and contain myself this morning. The, you know, the, this continual lawlessness, the, this continual law breaking, this complete and total disdain for the rule of law that we're seeing in the legislature, um, does, do, you know, does it incense the people enough to make a difference in the coming election cycle? We talked a little bit about it has to be in the primaries because we don't want a, 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 you know, lesser of two evils choice when it comes to the general um, your thoughts. I mean, you got any boots on the ground or anybody that you know anywhere that could be challenging some of these people? We're talking about Geisel and Coghill, Wilson. I mean, some of these other folks. Any word from you? Ron, Ron Gillum proved it can be done. Ron Gillum proved that you can take you can you can take a shoestring funded campaign, take an issue, correctly articulate it, run up against a, an incumbent, and and either damn near either beat him or uh, uh, do enough to change the incumbent's mind. Ron Gillum is 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 my is my shining star out there example of of how this can be done. So yes, I think it can be done. I mean, it's going to be tougher in some districts than others. Geisel's is a top twenty percent district. Its its average income is way the hell uh, above the median. It's in the top twenty percent itself. Its average income is in the top 20 percent it's going to be tough uh in that district jennifer johnson's in that district i mean you can see you can see that sort of that sort of support uh but you look at you look at cog hills district that's a fairly that's a fairly solid middle class district um and john you know john talks a great game about being mr conservative and and you know i'm conservative on all these issues but he's not he's gone lawless so somebody, a Ron Gillum in that district, uh, I'm hoping will step up uh, and make that run and and be able to articulate this, the issues in the same way Ron did uh, and, and make a very strong run uh, at John, if not defeat him. I certainly will be supporting a candidate who steps up, uh, who steps up and does that in district. So, yes, Ron Gillum proved it can be done. Yes. Uh, and, and the question now is finding the Ron Gillums in these other districts. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Pray for my strength, my friend, because I'm going to need it today. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is just so, I, in 20 years of covering Alaskan politics, I have never seen a legislature run so far off the rails, run so far afield, and just thwart the will of the people so blatantly 
And uh, I, mean, I just don't know what else to do at this point other than shout from the rooftops because I think it's, it's, the only it's thing we not do. the will of the people, Michael, that's so irritating to me. That's so irritating. It's the statutes. It's it's a statute that goes back to statehood that they're just ignoring and, and consciously ignoring. It's not like they it's not like they're they're saying, oops, you know, we missed that one. It's they know it's there. Right. And they're consciously ignoring. It's it's not the will of the people. It's the friggin statutes. Right. That, that they're ignoring. The lawlessness is what is what is driving driving me to the point of irritation. Let's talk about the weekly top three, shall we? The governor has not come out with the vetoes of his budget yet. He had two weeks from the 24th or from the 14th, which, I mean, I didn't hear about any pink slips going out, which should have happened five days ago if there was going to be some major government shutdown pink slips. I don't know what's going on. I haven't heard anything. I've been trying to look behind the scenes, talk to people. Uh, this this whole special session thing is consuming all the oxygen in the room. What's going on with the budget? And even if the governor does veto, where do we sit? Well, we, the, 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 as bad as this story is about about the special session, it will be overtaken by the end of the week uh, with the with the vetoes story. I mean, the governor. We we start July first is next Monday. That's the start of the of the fiscal fiscal year. The governor did not send out the pink slips, which means he's not going to shut down government. Um, the last business day is Friday, so. By by Friday, I expect that we will see the vetoes, and I expect the vetoes are going to be deep, um, and 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 far reaching. And so, the 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 big story at the end of the week, and the story we're sort of building up to 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 be prepared to talk about, um, and certainly we will be talking about now next week's show, is is the veto package the governor comes up with. But here's the deal. Even if the governor vetoed all the way down to the initial his initial budget, and he's not he's not going to do that. I mean, during the course of the session, uh, uh, various people from the administration admitted that some of the initial package was unreachable in terms of the in terms of the cuts, particularly on the Medicare side. Um, even if even if but even if he vetoed all the way down to the initial budget, there's still a deficit. There's still a deficit in in traditional revenues plus the revenues from the PFD draw remaining after the or from the permanent fund draw remaining after the PFD is paid and that deficit's not 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 uh, small it's about 400 million dollars it's about a tenth uh, of the budget uh, 10% of the budget a little bit over 10% of the budget so the story at the end of the week is going to be the governor did the vetoes there's still a deficit what's going to happen and wherever the special session lands uh, they're going to have to deal with. Uh, they'll, they, there may be some attempt to override the vetoes if the governor's done. The governor's staff's done a good job of of head counting uh, in this intervening period. They'll have the 16. The override, even if somebody tries it, should be should be uh, rejected. Um, and so they'll have a budget. Uh, we'll have revenues. Uh, and the question is going to be how are they going to close that gap? Some are going to. You know, push for PFD cuts to close the remaining gap. Uh, some are going to push to to close that gap from savings, but taking it from savings, frankly, is just taking it from future Alaskans. You're just taking money out of the pockets of future Alaskans. Um, so it's a tax on somebody, and and the big question as we roll into the special session um, that that people need to be thinking about is who are we going to tax? It's not a question of if we're going to tax. There is going to be a tax. The question is who we're going to tax uh, and whether it's going to be a tax through PFD cuts on the current generation, whether it's going to be a tax through uh, uh, savings reductions, which is a tax on future generations, or whether we're finally going to talk about a more efficient, more fair way to tax the current generation uh, to pay for uh, pay for the spending they've done. And, and but that's, that, that's going to be the big issue. Well, and let's be clear. The reason that there's going to be a tax is because the legislature lacks the will to live within their fiscal means. That's the, that is the bottom line to this. The legislature lacks the will to cut government back to the revenue source, and that is the whole problem in its entirety. End of statement. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, it, 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 it would be hard. I'm not saying it wouldn't be. It would be easy. But that's really the bottom line. Am I right? No, Michael, you've got to keep in mind that the governor's initial budget showed a deficit. Now, he papered over that deficit by proposing bills 
that would that would upstream uh, uh, property taxes from the lo- from localities from the North Slope borough. Yeah, four hundred million dollars worth. Four hundred million dollars. That's how he closed that deficit. Uh, but his initial his initial budget had a deficit. So it's it's not only and, and those bills, by the way, went no place. They didn't even get hearings. Uh, in the in the committees of first referral in either the Senate or the House, so they're 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 DOA. Those those are dead on arrival. So you got a, you got at least a four hundred million dollar deficit. So it's not just the legislature that can't make the cuts. Um, the governor, I I mean, it, 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 that's what the numbers say. The governor didn't make the cuts uh, necessary to get down to uh, down to traditional revenues. It's hard. We built up a we built up a state system. Uh, a system of state government in this state that is that is almost impossible uh, uh, to cut back back down to back down to the traditional revenue level. So it's not just the legislature. I mean, the legislature has played a huge role in this, certainly. Uh, but but even the governor has didn't cut back uh, state government back to uh, back to the revenue level. So bottom line on number one, we're going to have a deficit regardless of how deep the red pens cut. There's going to be a deficit. Best case scenario, we're talking about what three hundred and ninety plus million dollars. Yeah, we're rough, rough numbers. We're talking about four hundred million dollars. We're talking about the best case scenario. We're talking about four hundred million dollars. We're not going to get to the best case because the governor's not going to cut all the way back to the initial budget. So we're going to be talking about somewhere probably in the neighborhood of six hundred, seven hundred fifty million dollars uh, of deficit. And and then the question's going to be. Uh, who are we going to tax to pay that deficit? We're continuing now with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Uh, we're talking about the weekly top three. We just finished up with number one, which was the vetoes and what is left over, which is still a huge budget deficit. We move on to number two, which is the question of, uh, of what what about this violation of the law? I mean, they've continued this lawlessness. We've just been talking all morning about their new spate of lawlessness. But we keep hearing about how, oh, they're breaking multiple statutes or they're going to break one or the other and how somehow the POMV draw conflicts with the PFD statute. But Brad says, no, that's not really the case. It's kind of a fake news situation. Yeah, the the, uh, before yesterday's news about about the the legislative leadership or part of the legislative leadership going lawless, uh, my big anger moment. Uh, uh, of the last week was at KTOO News, which is the public media news outlet for Juno. Um, and one of the reporters there uh, included a sentence in one of his stories as a fact. He didn't attribute it to a source. Uh, he didn't say some say or some have argued or this legislature said. He just included this sentence uh, as a fact that, that, quote, a full div- dividend of roughly $3,000 would conflict with a law passed last year that limits how much the state can draw from earnings. He said that as a fact. That is wrong. It is, it is not. It, it, that's a wrong statement. The facts are, in fact, the opposite. The, 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 the two statutes don't conflict. Uh, but that's been a theme of some le- – that's that statement has been a theme of some legislators – who want to create this cloud over the PFD statute and say, oh, well, they conflict. And so we got to decide between the two. And, you know, we're going to decide for this one because because of, you know, 15 reasons that they that they sort of made up that that argument has been the argument of some legislators who create, create this cloud, want to create this cloud. OK, le- legislators, politicians sort of fudge facts all the time. But it's the role of the media to, to be straightforward and to and to and to give facts, actual facts, not fake facts, but give actual facts uh, in their story. And for the media, for KTOO Public News to pick up uh, that, those statements and, and not not modify it by saying Senator so and so argued or Representative so and so said to not modify it by that, but to state as their fact as KTOO News's fact that a full dividend of roughly $3,000 would conflict with the law last year, that's just, that's just wrong. It is spreading fake news uh, in a way that, um, uh, frankly, I think is, does a disservice to the public, does a disservice to, to their listeners, does a disservice to, to the state of discussion uh, uh, of issues in this state because we rely on the media 
uh, at least some of us re still rely on the media to be straightforward about these things. And frankly, I think for public media, it was a very it, it was a dangerous time to be doing that because again, at the end of this week, we're going to have the governor's vetoes. One of those vetoes is going to be uh, at least part of the budget for public media. Um, and I would I would have guessed there was some sympathy sympathy for public media, but if we've got public media out there stating fake news, making up news, stating as news opinion political opinions that that are not substantiated when you look at the facts, then I think that's a very dangerous thing for public media to be doing. And I and I really was was agitated about that. Um, uh, at the end of last week, the the the, the straightforward count. There is a straightforward calculation of how the 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 permanent fund statute or the the permanent fund statute works. First, uh, and even as modified last year, first you take 5.25 percent of the of the value of the permanent fund. That's the POMB draw. People argue about it, but that's what's in the statute currently. And if we're going to follow the statutes, it's 5.25 percent. Of the current market value, that gives you two nine billion, two point nine billion dollars. Second, and this is just going down the statute. Second, from that two point nine billion dollars, you subtract the permanent fund dividend, and the permanent fund dividend is calculated in a different way than the POMV. But the statute tells you how to calculate it, and then it says you subtract that from the two point nine billion. So the the permanent fund dividend calculated in the way the statute says is $1.9 billion. You've got about a billion dollars, $989 million. You've got about a billion dollars left over. That's what's available for government according to the statute. There's no conflict in the statute about that. The statute's very straightforward that that's how you do it. The, all the people who are saying there's a conflict want to create this cloud around it so that they can justify cutting the PFD. But as a lawyer looking at it, that's the straightforward way that the statute works. No questions, no ambiguity, no conflict, straightforward. So for the for KTOO to go out there, for the KTOO news reporter to go out there and say, oh, there's a conflict in the statute about that is just wrong. And 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 for a news media outlet to be to be taking political argument and turning that now into a statement of fact is just wrong, spreading fake news. In something that that needs to be called out and needs to be stopped. Well, and again, a very perilous time for them at this point, since the governor is in the process of running his vetoes. I mean, it'd be interesting to see that number run down to zero for public media in Juno, based simply on that statement alone. Retaliatory? Well, maybe. But at that point, I mean, if they're just going to pump out fake news, what good are they at that point anyway? Yeah, it's not retaliatory, Michael. I mean, if if you've got I mean, if, if you've got if you're funding this news source to provide news to to Alaskans, that news needs to be actual news. It needs not to be fake news. And if they're not going to provide that service, if they're not providing the service of actual news, then why the hell are you funding them? You're only funding another political operation uh, at that point. So I, I, I don't I'm not sure it's retaliatory. I'm, I'm it, it, it is evidence of the fact that. That they're not that the public media is not providing the service that that they claim to be providing, and that the legislature is using as the just justification for giving them dollars. If they're not providing that service, if they're not providing a news service, if they've turned in to a political advocacy service, then then the justification for those dollars goes way the heck down. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We're talking about the weekly top three. We've actually crushed it this morning. We're on through one and two, and that leads us on to number three, which is the continual sob story that we hear from the University of Alaska. Most recently, Jim Johnson has put out an opinion piece in the Anchorage Daily News that talks specifically about, well, if... The, the the university does so much, and by doing anything, you're putting higher education in the state at risk. And why do you hate the children? Jim Johnson is somebody that I was I was a big supporter of. Was 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 very um, uh, happy to see appointed by by uh, Governor Walker to be uh, president of the university system at the time it happened because Johnson had a background as a businessman. Somebody who'd also worked for the university, but who'd been out in the business world, sort of a no-nonsense business guy. And I thought, great, we're going to get somebody 
in charge of the university that 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 uh, that knows what they're doing and will be able to get the university under control. Like so many stories of when you put somebody over in a political organization, and the university, believe me, is a political organization. Like so many stories, Johnson appears to have been captured by the university. And instead of being a businessman sent in to get the university under control from a cost standpoint, he's now become a cheerleader. It's now turned into a cheerleader for a university system that's out of control. The reality is we cannot afford the university system we've built up. The reality is we cannot afford three separate independent universities in the state. We, can, we don't have the revenues to support that. It's 200. The state support to the university system is 250 percent of the national average. We're not talking about we're not talking about just a little bit over national average. We're talking about 250 percent of the national average. Governor Dunleavy's proposed to cut it down to 150 percent. Some people, you know, from the from the wailing that you hear, some people you, you would think that Governor Dunleavy's proposed to cut it down below the national average. He's proposed to cut it down to 150 percent of the national average. And if I were Jim Johnson, I would have said, fine, I understand that the state's fiscal situation is is tougher than we than we all wanted it to be. I understand I've got a role to play in that and I'm going to start getting the university in, into a situation. Instead of that, he's just tried to bluff through, bolster through, uh, bully through, and keep saying, ah, oh, you know, I, I know we're in a tough situation, but the university's, you know, special. We get to, we get to, like the legislature, we get to break the rules. We get to keep on going uh, at 250% at of the national average. Um, we don't. We're immune from you know all those other forces that, that that's bringing down spending <laughs> elsewhere. Arithmetic. And it's just it's, it's just turned it's just turned into a, into a silliness. Yeah. So. Well, are you we su are you surprised, Brad? I mean, they're immune to arithmetic. That's partially because they can't keep their teacher accreditation. So apparently, they can't keep up with arithmetic. So I mean, it's not surprising, right? <laughs> I'm surprised at Jim Johnson. I, I I will I will say I'm surprised at Jim Johnson. Jim Johnson had a reputation when he went into that job that I thought was going to result in, in a stellar uh, uh, period for the university, getting themselves in shape to live within, within the, the state's means uh, going forward. It's not, Jim Johnson's not turned out to be that way. So I, I am surprised at Jim Johnson. I, I'm surprised at his failure to, to bring all of the background that was used to justify his pick to the, to the role. And he's just, and as I say, he's just turned into a cheerleader. Jim Johnson's the whininess of this article, uh, you know, in light of the fact that even with the budgets that they had, they couldn't keep their accreditation. They can't keep things rolling. They've got a quarter of a billion dollars in deferred maintenance. I mean, I could go down the list uh, one thing after another and just show you all the things that are absolutely wrong with what's going on out there. And again, don't forget that if you don't support this, then you obviously hate the children and you hate the future of Alaska. Jim Johnson's been on notice since 2016 when Ironically, Tammy Wilson had inserted into the into the legislative appropriation bills, into the appropriation bills, a requirement that the university assess stepping down to one university, uh, uh, transitioning into one university. Jim Johnson's been on notice since 2016 that he needs to reimagine the university, that, that he needs to refocus the university to live within its means. He's had three years to do this job. Now, part of it, I mean, he would he would say, well, but Governor Walker let me off the hook because because I said I couldn't do it. Walker didn't press me on it. He continued Walker continued to fund me. I get to, you know, I wasn't really on notice I needed to do it. Businessman, the guy that got appointed Jim Johnson, would have said, "Yep, I can see the tea leaves. I can see where this is headed. I'm going to build a I'm going to reimagine a great university." built on solid funding of of you know x amount um and we're gonna we're gonna slim this thing down to be able to do it he didn't do it he got captured by the university it's like it's like sending an ambassador off right the united states sends an ambassador off to france right and, in, and instead of representing the u.s interests in france he comes back and he, and he and he gives you what france's position is right he turns into turns into a cheerleader for the country he got sent to. Jim Johnson's turned into a cheerleader for for the university. Okay, maybe maybe that's understandable, but but that's not what we needed at this point in time. We needed a businessman 
to go in and get the university under control. He hasn't done it, and that's a huge failure. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, Brad, final thoughts, give me 30 seconds. Well, the big story at the end of the week is going to be uh, is going to be the vetoes. People need to back up the governor on these vetoes. Everybody's, everybody's going to say, oh, do everything except cut my program. Forget that. The time now is to back up the governor on the vetoes, regardless of what they are. Support your legislators. Support the 16 or the 20 who are going to back up the governor. Yep. Don't complain about it. That's what we need to do. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We have links in the Facebook chat room for those of you that want to follow his page and get all the intel that he lays out every week. Brad, thanks so much for coming on. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.